Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the second meeting of the Young Women Lead Committee. This is a very unique committee that the Parliament is supporting in partnership with Young Women Lead. It's a leadership project that 30 young women from across Scotland are taking part in. Some are around the table today and others are with us in the public gallery. Today's session will run until approximately 10 to 1. And welcome to those who are watching online. Thank you for all your interest in this work. Before I say more about that, I would like um, to indulge myself as convener and talk about a recent visit I've had to North America and some uh, meetings which I had, which I think would be useful in terms of this inquiry that we're doing um, about sport and women's participation. I went to New York and I went to Toronto and I've had some interesting findings from people we met there. The one I want to particularly talk about was a meeting uh, with United Nations Women in, in New York. And they actually have a specialist called Jennifer Cooper who deals entirely with sport and women's participation. It was a real learning, learning curve for me. And before I go on to uh, potential dealings with Jennifer, um, just to, to say to you that from an international context, uh, not just in developed nations, I found some of what was discussed really interesting. And this is actually, sounds quite simplistic, but I've been thinking about it a lot since. The women that were there who work in developing nations across Africa, across Asia, were telling me about the importance of sport even in these contexts and the problems it causes because women culturally or for poverty reasons do not get involved in sport at all. And it therefore means that women are disadvantaged in all walks of life. I found this difficult to understand what they were getting at until they said to me, if women are never involved in sport, when natural disasters come along, it ends up that more women are killed, damaged, affected by these natural disasters. And it's as simple as women never been taught how to run, how to climb. So for example, they used the tsunami as an example. Um, women tended to just stand and wait for it to happen whereas men and boys ran away to higher ground, climbed trees, etc. So therefore, there's a direct impact, even in something as fundamental as life-saving, where women are not encouraged to get involved in sport. I felt that was a, a really interesting international context. Um, the work that Jennifer is doing um, also affects or potentially affects us here. For example, through the United Nations, she's currently working on a, a memorandum of understanding with FIFA ahead of the summer's World Cup. And she's keen to engage with the SFA and other Scottish colleagues. So um, she's, she was very interested in the work that this committee is doing. And I thought perhaps we could try and arrange a video conference at the next meeting so that you can um, relate to the United Nations and the work that they do. I also there met the Canadian Association for the Advancement of Sport and Physical Activity. That was interesting too. And to pick up on something we've looked at before, she told us that all the studies that have been carried out um, show that women coaches, if we had more women coaches, um, it would be better to be able to develop the respective sports. What she also said was that at a participation level, there are quite a lot of women coaches in communities. However, when a sport starts to become more competitive, go higher up the ladder and you start to get into competition, etc., the number of women coaches dwindles and that's when the men coaches start to come in. So she's looking at a bit of work that says, how do we encourage women coaches to participate at higher levels as well? So they were the two particular meetings in New York and Toronto 
that I thought were most of interest. Does anyone have any questions about that before we move on to the next part of the meeting? Yes, um, Amy. Through, throughout our own research, we found that women coaches and role models um, was in, vital to increasing participation. Could you elaborate slightly further if there's any methods that they're putting in place to try and increase women coaches and really make sure that they kind of rise up? Well, what we said to Clemence was that we would come back to this meeting and take your views on that, and she's more than happy to share her research with us. So again, I can get that out to you for further discussion at the next meeting. Yeah. All right, we'll move on. Uh, this committee last met in January, and of course that was the topic of inquiry that we decided to do. And Barriers to participation was the main thing that we thought we would focus on. We had a meeting in February and the committee members undertook engagement activities to hear the voices and experiences of young women across Scotland. And at today's meeting, we'll be hearing the results of those engagement activities. So I'm very happy to welcome our first panel who will tell us about the work they undertook, looking at the impact of socioeconomic factors, protected characteristics, and intersectionality, which all sounds very technical. So welcome Jenny, Jenny Snell and Svea Horn. And can I give you up to 10 minutes, please, to make your presentation before we move to questions? Um, so overall, as a group, we looked at the relationship of young women in sports, as you just said. And our group in particular thought about how certain protected characteristics and socioeconomic situations might affect or impact the participation of women. Um, because women face barriers um, anyway in sports. And if you add additional barriers um, for those women who fall under these protected characteristics, um, that it's even more barriers to the additional ones that you have anyway. Um, we also thought that socioeconomic barriers are also important to consider in top of um, general protected characteristics because we found just in our early research that that's something that um, comes up a lot and impacts a lot of women. Um, so in order to find all this out, we used a survey as our main source of data collection um, and we attached it to the group who were looking at uh, young women in schools and we decided that that would be more effective rather than sending out two separate surveys. The survey was promoted on social media for a three week period and was also sent through a targeted approach to organisations um, who work with the communities um, that we were kind of looking to engage. And overall, we had 618 completed responses to the survey, which we thought was quite a high engagement overall. In addition to the surveys, we also reached out to organisations um, individually um, to provide some case studies and information on how um, protected characteristics and socioeconomic barriers can impact on women's participation in sport. Um, and we didn't receive a lot of feedback from these organisations, but we still received some, which we think will have benefit to the findings. One of the areas that we looked at was the social economic barriers and in the survey we asked the question, do you feel your participation in sports is affected by how much money you or your family has? We had over 400 responses to that question and of that 80% commented that they thought family income or a lack of, kind of disposable income was a, a barrier to their participation in sport. The reasons for this varied, but those coming in the highest was the cost of membership fees for sports clubs, um, the cost of gyms, um, and the cost of like sports um, in general. So, like forty percent responded that this was a barrier. Um, the cost of competing also came in quite high, with twenty percent of people highlighting that this would be a barrier. So, things like dance exam costs or tournament costs, and a quarter of the respondents noted that costs associated with sports such as equipment and clothing was a barrier, so things like trainers, um, gym clothes, PE kits, and a further 10% noted that travel costs were a barrier, uh, specifically in rural areas, so getting to and from sports clubs. Um, a lot of the younger women had to rely on parents for lifts. So the socioeconomic barriers was the highest trend that we identified overall in our survey um, and it was quite broad across all age groups so young women in schools, students, professionals and young mums. Um, 
We also looked at sexuality as a protected characteristic and asked specifically, do you identify as any other, anything other than straight and other things like that? And then we asked our protected characteristic question, which was, has any part of your identity or a certain characteristic ever affected your relationship with sport or physical activity? Um, and for that question, we had a really high response rate um, for members of the LGBTQ plus community, also women in general. So a lot of what we did not expect was that a lot of responses to gender were just linked to women, not specifically to the LGBTQ plus community. Um, we also found that um, the participation of LGBTQ plus um, um, women who responded to our survey was just under one um, one quarter of the whole survey responses, so quite high. Um, and 22% of those commented that they had, um, ne had had negative experiences due to their identity. Um, but generally, we also found that not just specifically for LGBTQ plus um, women, but uh, for all women, that there's a lack of safe spaces for changing. Um, for example, there was one woman who replied to our um, survey who identifies as bi, who said that she was made to change in this disabled changing room in high school after she came out. Um, we also had one, about 1% 1 of responses reflecting the current media coverage of um, inclusion of trans people in sport, which also highlights the current atmosphere of um, that trans community faces when they want to participate, participate in sport. Um, so that's kind of understandable why these numbers might be lower than usual. Um, we also looked at disability and we asked the question, do you consider yourself to have a disability in the survey? And then asked the further question on protected characteristics. Um, 68 respondents to the survey highlighted that they considered themselves to have a disability and of that 68, 18% responded that they felt it impacted negatively on their relationship with sport. Um, there was a range of disabilities and conditions mentioned in the survey, but the majority were non-visible disabilities, such as inflammatory conditions and ehlers dan loss, um, hypermobility. Um, and respondents highlighted that they felt there was a lack of awareness and training for teachers to support young women with um, non-visible disabilities. Um, and that is an area that we think could be looked at in regards to recommendations. We also received some organisational feedback from a pelvic physiotherapist who commented that incontinence is a huge barrier to young women. Um, the figure was 20% of young women um, can suffer from incontinence, but it's not a, a spoken about subject. It's still got a lot of stigma surrounding it. Um, and there's a lot of embarrassment associated with kind of commenting on that. We didn't have any responses in the survey um, about incontinence, but we did have the response from the organisation who said there was a lack of training for teachers and there's also a lack of education in PSE classes for young women to recognise the kind of signs and symptoms of that. Um, we also looked at pregnancy in single and young parenthood, so young mums in particular. And the question that we had in our survey was, do you have children? And if you do have children, how has that impacted your relationship with sports? And out of all of the over 600 uh, responses, we had 67 survey participants saying that they had kids, and 65 of those, 65% um, of those said um, having kids had had a negative impact on their relationship to sports. Um, a lot of the comments uh, were on a lack of options available for women to participate before, during, and after pregnancy, and for women um, who have young kids who need childcare. Um, however, we also had 14% that said that the participation had increased, um, mostly because they wanted to set a good example and be a good role model for their kids in the future. Um, yeah. And the final area we looked at was um, race and religion. Um, so we asked um, about ethnic groups in the survey and we asked about how that impacted on um, relationships with sports. However, we had a really low return rate from um, BAME women. Um, we only had 4% overall who responded and there was very few comments on how it impacted on the relationship with sport. Um, only 5% commented that a protected characteristic associated with race or religion had impacted their participation levels. And those reasons were mostly due to cultural and religious attire. So we had one respondent say that 
Um, I feel that since I wear the hijab, I am judged from coming into the gym or going to a sports club. I do not feel welcome, therefore I mostly exercise at home. Um, so I think more research needs to be done on that area to get a more accurate response. Thank you very much, panel. And I think we'll open up to questions now, and I'll go first to my vice convener, Beth Clotten. Thank you, and thank you for presenting your information. Um, my first question is about economic barriers. Um, in your research, you talk about active sterling, and I was wondering whether you thought that was a successful project, and if so, if it should be replicated to other councils. Yes, we yeah. Um, so I specifically had a look at Active Sterling and Juno Research and I think overall, I think it is a successful project because 16% um, sterling, of Sterling's overall population is participating in sport compared to 12% uh, in other local authorities. So that's um, a 4% increase, which I think is quite um, impressive for the short time that I have run this project. It is also supported by the Stirling Council, so if this could be replicated in other councils, then that I think would actually make a difference and increase sports, especially for women with um, low incomes. Um, Act of Stirling has a £20 per month membership, which I think is cheaper than a lot of other bigger um, gyms, and um, you can, can't only use the um, gyms, you can also use any other facilities which are included in the programme as well. So it really helps a lot of people um, and it also specifically tar targets um, the areas uh, around Stirling or Stirling area where there's a lot of people who don't have a lot of money. So they're specifically trying to get these people involved as well. Mm -hmm. Any other questions here? Yes, Lauren Aitchison. Um, I found some of the comments about LGBT pupils quite distressing actually and um, not just from teachers but their fellow pupils that there's this, still this sense that um, LGBT people can't control um, sexual impulses and are inherently dangerous in some way and I was just wondering what you thought schools could do to, you know, is this a sex education issue, like a healthy relationships issue that needs to be taken up elsewhere? Um, I think that there is a lot of work at the moment going on in um, education around school with the Thai campaign. Um, I think that will have a hopefully a really positive um, impact on the peer kind of assumptions of LGBT community um, in PSE classes. Um, and also I know that like organisations such as Leap Sports are doing a lot of work as well on how to engage more LGBT um, young people in sports and how to kind of make that a more inclusive process. Um, so. Yeah. Do you have anything to add? Okay. <laughs> Becky White. Um, so how do you propose that um, we combat the barriers that exist for parents? Svea Horn. I think um, what a lot of uh, young mums especially brought up, or young mums of young children, is that of childcare because you have to have your child look after while you exercise. It's very difficult to do both at the same time, although it could be considered a form of exercise as well. Um, so I think that's the biggest issue. And just I think that's something that will be touched upon later as well. Body, con body image and self-confidence, especially after pregnancy, I think is quite a, a big factor affecting that as well. So if you could improve this with um, maybe campaigns within gyms um, or something like that, that would help. Any further questions on these issues? No? Thank you very, very much. That was a, a very comprehensive presentation. And I'm sure there'll be more questions come to mind when we all read over uh, the evidence you've given. Thank you. And I'll suspend briefly to allow a change of witnesses.
reconvene and welcome our second panel for this morning who will be discussing the work that they have done looking at the provision of sport and physical activity in schools. Now, I see there's three panel members, Becky White, Hannah Gray and Amy Leishman. And could I ask that when it comes to answering questions, we won't have time for all three of you to, to do that. So like the last panel, could you indicate to me who is going to answer the particular question? If you feel that you really must come in and add something, let me know and we'll accommodate that. So can I invite you to make opening remarks of up to 10 minutes, please? Becky. So we were researching the provision and the barriers to sport and PE in schools and how this influences attitudes amongst young women. So we did this through two surveys, three teacher interviews and one focus group. So for the survey, we did this alongside the group who are researching protected characteristics. So we created a survey aimed at women aged between 13 and 30, asking for their lived experiences. In addition to this, we also put together and shared a survey aimed solely at teachers, alongside interviewing three PE teachers, which allowed us to gain a valuable insight into how sport and PE at school is viewed, understood and valued by those who teach it. So in terms of responses, we had 613 responses from young women, 900, sorry, 192 of which were still at school, and we also had 257 responses from teachers. For three weeks, both surveys were promoted through social media platforms, as well as targeting individuals and organisations from a variety of sporting, political and feminist backgrounds. So in terms of the geographical demographic of our results for the pupil survey, we managed to reach 31 out of 32 local authorities. Um, but the majority of the results came from the central belt. For the pupil survey, we focused in on the following areas. Enjoyment of PE in primary school and secondary school, whether school had helped them understand the benefits of exercise and diet, how to improve enjoyment of PE at school, the barriers to taking part in PE and exercise out with school. For the teacher survey, we wanted to explore young women's direct voices, the curriculum and teaching methods. So in the survey, we asked teachers what barrier did they perceive that young women face in regards to participation in sport or exercise at school. And we also posed a similar question to barriers in the pupil survey. So 56% of pupils said that body confidence was an issue and 73% of teachers also saw this as a barrier, which shows that they kind of both see it as a barrier. 45% um, of teachers saw PE kit as a barrier, whereas only 11% of pupils said this was an issue. 35% of teachers viewed menstruation as a barrier, which matches the 36% of pupils who also view this as an issue. And 28% of teachers viewed facilities within school as a barrier, but only 16% of pupils viewed this as an issue. So our other barriers that pupils mentioned included ability and lack of motivation and other barriers that teach. PE teachers viewed included mixed gender activities, perception of gender roles and provision of activities within the school. So the pupil survey also highlighted some other interesting results, which included that only 40% 40, 40, of respondents agreed or strongly agreed that school had taught them about the importance of a balanced diet and the same with the benefits of physical activity. We also saw that 83% of young women stated that they agreed or strongly agreed that at primary school they enjoyed PE, but then when same but then when posed the same question about secondary school, it massively decreased to only 56%, no, sorry, 54%. And 53% of respondents said their enjoyment between primary and secondary declined. But however, 14% did say it had increased. And 74% of respondents took part in sport of exercise out of school. So we also included some open questions, allowing for additional information. So when we asked why respondents' level of enjoyment had changed between primary and secondary school, we found four main areas gender dynamics, competitiveness, judgment, and body confidence. So we also conducted three teacher interviews. So we did this to gain an insight into their lived experience of PE teaching. So the first teacher we interviewed was Ross Johnson, who won Young Coach of the Year in 2018, and coaches rugby at an Edinburgh Public School and works, with girl of all, and works with girls of all ages and from all backgrounds. So the barriers that he identified were lack of equipment, body confidence, gender dynamics, and lack of time. We also interviewed Jude McMullen, who teaches PE at an independent school in Dundee. She also coaches hockey, and she noticed that girls from a traditionally active background tended not to drop out, but the other girls would. So although McMullen herself loves sport and has done all her life, she can still feel intimidated in some sports situation, such as the weight sections of a gym. A brilliant quote that we got from her was, if someone like me, who is sports staff, feels intimidated in some sporting situations, what will others who don't re regularly exercise feel? 
And the last teacher we interviewed was Jess Jameson, who is a PE teacher who has worked at both independent and public schools throughout the Centre Belt. She noticed that pupils in more affluent areas tended to have more confidence to participate in sport more, as well as to have a wider access as well as having a better access to a wider range of opportunities and facilities. So we also found out about how they encourage young women in sport, barriers out with school and what they think could be done to make more young women participate in sport. We also conducted a focus group which can, of, with a local girl guiding group which consisted of 20 guides aged between 10 and 12 from Edinburgh. So we asked what they would change about PE, what they liked and disliked about PE and a key theme that came up from all that was sexism. Um, so we also conducted a teacher survey and here are some of the interesting findings. So 86% of the teachers um, said that they agreed or strongly agreed that the young men that they teach were enthusiastic about sport, but when we posed the same question regarding um, young women, only 61% agreed or strongly agreed. And we also saw further repetition of already common themes um, and barriers such as lack of equipment, lack of facilities, body confidence and PE kit. Right. So you're speaking for the three of you, Becky. Good. OK, I shall open up to questions. Um, Beth. Thank you, and thank you again for presenting. Um, what I wanted to ask is about what you think schools could do to improve young women's confidence, because that seems to be a major issue and why they don't enjoy participating in sport. Amy, I can come in on this one. Amy Leishman. So I think that we really saw that there was a real focus around body confidence issues um, in schools and within young women. Both teachers and young women agreed that body confidence was a massive issue in their enjoyment and their participation. So we thought that ways that schools could actually tackle this is to actually teach women and focus, um, provide more focus at schools on how women's bodies change, um, like what they should expect and just really kind of prepare young women and just boost their confidence that way. We also thought that potentially offering cubicles um, in school changing rooms which would allow young women to have privacy um, would also increase their confidence. It would allow them to actually get changed um, away from kind of prying eyes if they do have body confidence issues as well. And also um, female role models was another big one to increase confidence. And I think that's um, been seen kind of throughout each group, that female role models is a big issue, that we need more female leaders um, so that young women can actually see themselves in others and then see that they can also go on and they can kind of achieve and do, do what they want. Yes, Hannah Gray. So um, the other thing I was thinking of is that we also heard a lot about um, pupil or student centeredness and asking young people what they're looking for in young women. This was reflected in Professor David Kirk, who came to our last committee meeting in his evidence about the advantage of student centeredness, but also was reflected in our surveys where one of the highest results was around more choice of activities, 54% of young women that we spoke to in secondary school. Um, they said that the key thing was student-centredness and them hearing that, not that it was student-centredness, that it was um, uh, more, um, more choice and activities and would increase their, um, the way that they feel about um, engaging in participation and, and removing barriers. And that was something that was reflected in the teacher's survey or the teacher questionnaire survey, one of them, um, that we did, um, which is one of the teachers had a really good example of where... Um, they had changed from um, having white pee kits and white shirts because a lot of the young women felt they were see-through and the young women reflected that if these were changed then it would increase their engagement and that was actually shown at that school that it improved the engagement when that voice was heard of the young women. Hmm. Maxine Kearney. Yeah, did you find it challenging to reach out to teachers while conducting this research? And if so, how did you manage to overcome these challenges? Becky White. So we managed to reach 257 teachers, which we still think is quite a good number. Um, the issues that we did have, though, was that um, when we were doing our engagement, it was the school holidays, so we weren't able to connect with schools as much as we would have hoped. But I still think we definitely got a lot of teachers as well as doing the teacher interviews. Lisa Douglas. Um, regarding your teacher survey, what were the percentage of male and female teachers that responded and were their responses different? Huh. 
Amy Leishman. So 89% were female respondents, which um, I think shows that our kind of engagement was more targeted towards women, or maybe women were the ones that kind of came back to it because they felt that they had something to say. Um, I think next time, if we wanted to gather more information, we would want to maybe create a survey or a questionnaire that actually specifically targets male teachers to ask the same questions so that we can actually compare the data on that. Um, in regards to the actual differences in responses, that's something that we could get back to you. But just because there was 89%, um, we didn't really have many responses from male teachers, so we don't really have that data. Kiara Maguire. I was just wondering, um, did you find at all during your research if teachers felt able to talk to young women about the issues that came up around PE and sport, like body image and stuff? Hannah Gray. I don't know if we kind of, there was um, quite a high response rate to our survey and certainly teachers in general, I don't have the exact statistics, their main focus was I suppose on they could see barriers to young women um, and I think their main focus was on kind of how that played out in PE. Um, I think one of the interesting things was how much they talked about role models um, and positive role models within that environment but I don't know if anyone else has anything to add on that. Becky White. Um, so in one of the teacher interviews we did, um, I think it was Ross Johnson, he, um, he now has multiple female volunteers because he sometimes didn't feel um, confident or comfortable or the girls wouldn't feel confident or comfortable ta um, talking to him about some of the barriers they faced, whereas now they can confide in some of the female volunteers. Hmm. Amy Leishman. Just to add to what Becky said, um, I was interviewing Ross and one of the things that he really stressed was that actually being able to train those female volunteers up had allowed him to also kind of challenge um, issues that he had or worries that he had. Um, as a male teacher of um, female young women, he said that he had issues with going into changing rooms um, or discussing um, kind of female only issues so he said that himself as a coach it also helped him to have female role models as well and female volunteers so I think that's quite an interesting fact that it's not only pupils that it's benefiting it's also coaches and teachers that it would help. Lauren Aitchison. Yeah sorry it's on. <laughs> um, I was just wondering um, with the focus group that you did whether um, any of the young women had given um, more details about the sexism that they encountered from teachers and what form this took. Hannah Gray. Um, it was unfortunately we neither none of us were directly at that focus group, um, and, but we were quite interested in the fact there seemed to be a very um, high number in that small group of um, young people that talked about sexism between the ages of 12, 10 and 12, which I was quite shocked at. We weren't particularly sure if it was just maybe a specific teacher or whether because it was such a narrow focus group, but it would be something we would possibly like to explore more. But I know Girl Guiding UK have done quite a lot of work and a lot of reports on um, sexism and sort of general um, the experience of young women in Scotland. Yes, Becky White. Um, so like one of the direct quotes from the focus group when we asked like, um, what don't you like about PE? It was when you ha um, our PE teacher is sexist. And when we asked like what they would change, the top um, thing that most of them advised was um, reduce sexism towards girls. Ah. Olivia, can you keep? Hi, um, I just wanted to ask, I find the findings about the lack of equipment and facilities interesting, but what could we do as a group to change that outcome of providing more facilities for um, pupils that find it as a barrier? Like, What methods or strategies could we do to change that, to increase that participation for females? Amy Leishman. This is um, kind of anecdotal evidence, again, taken from our teacher interview, um, but one of the ways that Ross Johnson, who coaches young women in rugby, um, and he actually coaches every Thursday, and his participation rates are around about 35 young women every single Thursday, and I think that that is um, quite a good, a big success. Um, he says that they have like a bowling policy with shoes, because one of the issues was that a lot of the young women wouldn't have rugby boots, which can make it quite difficult to play on the grass. Um, so what he does is they, their school or their team 
bought um, a whole bunch of rugby boots in different sizes and they operate this kind of you give in your shoes, you get the rugby boots. So maybe just thinking kind of creatively and outside the box um, on different methods of letting young women borrow equipment, not having to spend um, their own money on equipment. So it allows um, people to try things out and then keep participating if they want. Um, in regards to actual facilities, I guess, funding for facilities. Um, but yeah, apart from that, I don't know if there's anything else to add. Hannah Gray. I was just going to add to that. I think that's about that. Also, that student centeredness and student support, and actually asking. You know, we're only a small group of young women, but there's clearly a voice of where there maybe are solutions, and maybe it isn't all about funding, but it's just about hearing voices of where there is discomfort and responding on an individual basis to what that is. Any further questions or quick comments? OK, thank you very much, Pamela. I found that really interesting and concerning uh, for me um, about 10 to 12-year-olds feeling that they suffered sexism uh, so young. And I do know that Girl Guiding UK, as, as Hannah said, um, have done a lot of work on that and had a very specific year where they were looking at the experiences of the young women that they deal with. So I'm sure they would be very helpful in giving a lot more information on that. Thank you very much, panel. And again, I'll suspend briefly to allow for a change of witnesses. We will reconvene and uh, welcome our third panel this morning, who will be discussing the work they have done looking into the influence of social media on the relationships young women have with sport and physical activity. So welcome Ashley Stein, Katrina Lambert, Samantha Stewart and Anna Henshaw. And can I have your opening remarks for up to 10 minutes, please? Samantha Stewart. Instagram is used by 1 billion people worldwide. 90% of these are under 35. Uh, Samantha, can I ask you to... Come up. Too loud. <laughs> <laughs> it's not like you, is it? <laughs> <laughs> OK. Instagram is used by 1 billion people worldwide. 90% of these are under 35. From the experiences of the young women lead participants and our peers and evidence provided by witnesses at our first meeting in February, we felt it was the perfect platform for us to investigate societal pressures and external influences with a particular look at social media on young women's relationship with physical activity and sport. We posted questions, polls and opportunities to respond over five consecutive days, um, targeting self-identifying young women under 30 to respond in any way they felt. Doing engagement work in this way, which will ultimately contribute towards our report and recommendations, is a new and innovative method to reach the target group. We felt we had to go directly to young women who are digesting and exposed to these images every day. Anxious, fluctuating, love, guilt, health. These were just some of the words young women used to describe their relationship with sport and physical activity when asked. It was clear from these responses that everyone has their own unique relationship and that these can be changeable, suggesting a number of factors are at play. Despite most respondents stating that they follow fitness-based accounts and more stating that they follow body-positive accounts on Instagram and other social media platforms, two-thirds said that social media makes them feel worse about their relationship with sport and physical activity. The body-positive accounts generally make young women feel better than general fitness accounts, but this is not universal, as may have been expected. Clearly, many young women are interested 
and drawn to this type of media and content, but a lot of what exists currently is not largely impacting them in a positive way. Some of the themes that we got from responses showing why this could be is that the content focuses too much on aesthetic versus fitness and well-being. Sexualisation of women is rife and must be avoided, and content needs to be both representative and realistic. Also, positive spaces, clubs and opportunities for women to engage with sport and physical activity should be promoted and encouraged more on these platforms. We also gathered more information that echoes some of the evidence we heard from a witness in February regarding role models in sport. Only 8 out of 22 respondents in this area said that their role model was a famous or well-known female athlete, and that mostly their friends or relatives or their coaches and people closer to them were who they looked up to um, regarding sporting role models. Overall, despite the research here being limited in some ways and being purely anecdotal, the themes and ideas raised show that social media should be taken seriously in regards to its role in shaping young women's mental health relating to physical activity and more broadly. We feel this shows a need to consider it for informing future research and recommendations. No one else going to... Oh, that's wonderful, because you, you want some discussion then to use up all your time. Very, very good. OK, um, I'm going to go first to Beth Cohen. Um, you suggest that we should avoid um, the sexualisation of women when exercising, but how do you think this can be brought about? Katrina Lambert. Um, I think that it's not a kind of there's not one solution to it. It's something that's you know very widespread in society. I think on one level there needs to be an element of cultural change in kind of how we treat women and how we perceive women's bodies and what they look like. And I think that is something that can be done very much through education, um, through speaking to kind of like young people, young boys, as well as young girls about how to treat women and kind of like what's appropriate and what you know female bodies look like. Um, but I think there also is an opportunity potentially for some change in policy and. And in, in the sort of regulation of how women are portrayed in the media, we've seen this kind of um, recently in gender stereotypes and advertising. We've had advertising bodies and regulators actually taking some action to reduce the gender stereotypes. I think there's potential for some sort of um, more legislative and regulatory um, change as well. But it's not one or the other. There definitely needs to be both of those happening at the same time. Okay, Adam McGuire. Um, so I was wondering why you think it is the case that young women are more likely to see women who are close to them, like family members and friends, as role models rather than more famous athletes. Anna Henschel. Um, I think this has probably uh, several reasons. So uh, this is purely speculative, so this is not supported by our uh, social media evidence, but I think that especially in the media, um, it is mainly male athletes, very famous male athletes that get a lot of uh, screen time and get a lot of coverage. And um, like most of the reporting about sports, like if you just watch the news in the evening, it's always about any kind of male sports, like male soccer. And um, so maybe there isn't a lot of visibility of these uh, female athletes. And, and of course, there are many very famous female athletes as well, but then it seems maybe a bit... Uh, more distant than uh, than these very present male uh, role models. So then it might seem more intuitive to look more towards your own um, yeah environment to uh, to look for these role models. Samantha Stewart. Um, yeah, just to add to that, I think it's it kind of echoes a more societal wide problem of um, women not being represented higher up in, in lots of fields, most fields um, in the world in sport is a, a really good example of this. So I think that we are kind of, it's ingrained that we shouldn't aim as high as men maybe. I think that's probably pretty safe to say in sport in particular. So that could also be at play as well, um, that we don't think that we're ever going to get to that point. So why would we, yeah. Um, yeah. You, yeah, we have time in this session for some comment as well as some questions. Lisa Douglas. Um, did you find when using social media, in particular your Instagram takeover, was successful in reaching young women? And do you think there was advantages and disadvantages to using that platform? Katrina Lambert. So 
obviously this was quite a new method of engagement and we sort of went into it not knowing exactly what was going to come out but the reasoning is that we were looking at social media we wanted to go to young women where they were using social media and where we knew they were going to be interacting i think that um it was very it, you know people picked up on the fact that it was quite exciting we did get you know engagement and kind of coverage of it and i think it allowed um, it removed a lot of the barriers that exist in a lot of engagement, particularly with a parliament like this, which can often be seen as quite scary, quite intimidating. There's a lot of language barriers to get through. I think because we had it in an accessible format and we were going to young women in a way that they understood and they were able to express their opinions, I think that it was really exciting to be able to get their views that way. Obviously, there were some kind of concerns that you know we had about the number of people that we were reaching um, it was never going to be as many as it would be through the likes of a survey or through focus groups and obviously it was only young women who were able to access our social, social media and were to already some extent engaged so I think um, in the future obviously this I think this engagement is something that would be very exciting to kind of take forward but it would need some refinement in how we kind of specifically target as many women as possible and sort of looking at the analytics of things like times to post and the sort of nitty-gritty of actually making the best of social media but overall I think it was a really positive experience and it was very um, exciting to be in a position where we could do our research in that manner. Olivia can you keep Hi, you mentioned in one of your questions about social media being um, the people that responded, they felt worse about sports and exercise. But do you feel uh, different body positivity accounts can help build that healthy relationship with sports, fitness and body image? Samantha Stewart. Um, I would say based on the evidence that we got that generally speaking, the body positive accounts made them feel better than the, than the normal accounts, if you like just based on fitness, but obviously that's hard to control what that content actually is. Um, we're being quite general in saying this type of account versus um, the other. But I found it interesting that you would maybe assume that a body positive account is automatically going to make you feel better, but actually in all, not that didn't happen in all cases. Um, so I think that the content regulation is still at play here and there's more factors so we kind of speculated that it might be that we still have a tendency to compare ourselves to people that we see on social media and these images and even if it is somebody that is a bit more representative of what we look like or how we feel if maybe on that day that we're looking at their positive image we're not feeling like that then it can have just as big a detrimental effect so I think there's a, a whole issue with social media and, and what we're exposed to and how frequently and how, what a big part of young women's life it is now. It's not going to go away. So we need to think about what is there and the impact that that is having and that it's not as black and white as this is positive, this isn't. Amy Leishman. Within your um, evidence, you made a distinction between fitness pages and body positive pages. I was just wondering if you'd seen um, the different comments, if there was a difference in the comments and the messages that were portrayed on either type of account. Katrina Lambert. So I think when we were looking at kind of like formulating these questions, we wanted to make that distinction uh, kind of between these two accounts, because we think although often they will be dealing with similar issues of kind of you know, body and sport, they have a quite different way of approaching that message. We see that a lot of these kind of fitness exercise accounts, it's very focused on aesthetic, looking a certain way. Often this is linked to promotion of products such as dieting products. We've seen a lot of coverage of that in the media recently with petitions going to both this parliament and the UK parliament. Um, um, we saw, in contrast, a lot of body positivity accounts, although they were dealing with similar issues, the message did tend to be one that was more positive and kind of encouraging women to kind of be the best version of themselves, but not in a way that was going to be damaging to their mental or physical health. Um, but it was still, um, like Samantha said earlier, interesting to note that despite the positive message we were seeing from these body positivity accounts, there was still an element that some young women didn't, that didn't necessarily mean that they always felt good about themselves from interacting with them. Beth Clinton. Um, I was just wondering if you have any opinions on the role model research that you got and the sexualization of women, because obviously like women should embrace their sexuality if they want to, but it seems like there is a relationship between 
women preferring to use like family or friends to like represent them or to look to them for inspiration rather than female athletes and do you think there's something like a relationship between like the overt sexualization of women when exercising and that being like quite a homogenous image that not all women can relate to um do you think that is why women kind of tend to relate more to women that are presented quite holistically Samantha Stewart. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I do think that that probably is a factor. Obviously, we can't determine causation based on what we've um, what we've done here, but I think that is probably quite um, a safe assumption to make. That must be part of it because it's these unrealistic images that we're being fed and that we can't relate to, um, and even you know the treatment of some of the top female athletes. So, like Serena Williams for example, is probably the main example that people use, the way her body is scrutinised and the way she's presented in media, although it's got better recently, it's still not the same as our male counterparts. So I think it's even the people that we should be looking up to, they don't have it easy either. So, yeah, so I think that is a big part of it, of how these, um, yeah, female athletes are presented in themselves and we wouldn't want to aim for that either. Yes, Anna Henschel. Um, I think if I can add from my own anecdotal experience, um, it's also just these professional female athletes, I feel completely removed from them as a person who enjoys sports because the way they look when they are exercising is always still fantastic, while when I exercise, I don't want to, like for example, I'm embarrassed to, to recognize even friends at the gym because I, I feel self-conscious. So I think if you look at your friends who also don't look glamorous when they're exercising. I think that can be quite nice and quite encouraging and motivating. Do we have any comments? Yes, Rona Wilder. Um, one of the recommendations was less of a focus on aesthetic. Um, and I was wondering if you had any thoughts on how we approach this on a platform like Instagram that's entirely based on images. <laughs> <laughs> ah, you stumped them, Rona. <laughs> Samantha Stewart. Um, yeah, I think that's similar to what we were saying earlier about there being some regulations um, around it. I think that echoes what I said, that generally speaking, because Instagram is used by a vast majority of under 35s, it's possibly not taken as seriously um, as a platform for engagement or that can have an effect on people um, as maybe more traditional media. But we need to kind of face facts that that is where people our age and, and younger are digesting things. So I think regulations in that sense and how much the Instagram and Facebook and um, the like are all being used for advertising purposes now. So the same regulations that are put on TV adverts and things, that must be accounted for. So as Katrina mentioned, there are petitions and, and things in place that are starting to, to take place. But I think that that needs to be pushed and yeah taken seriously. Katrina Lambert. I think also, um, obviously, you know, all these kind of, we'd like to see some change in what's happening on social media, but I think we need to, like you said, except, you know, Instagram is to some extent always going to have an element of aesthetic because it is kind of image based. But I think that doesn't mean that there's not things that we can do. I think um, it could be, we need to have more education for young women on kind of like dealing with social media and actually improving their confidence because we can do all the action that we can to try and make sure that this isn't out there and it's not what people are consuming. But, you know, there are thousands of young women living in Scotland and some of them are going to be exposed to things which make them feel bad about their bodies and means that they don't want to participate in sport. So I think that there is a really exciting opportunity to actually look at, particularly in schools, because we've seen that um, I'm in my last year at school at the moment, but I can see girls in years much younger than me already being impacted by social media as young as nine or ten, um, already having to deal with those issues of how they feel about their bodies and seeing them then drop out of sport as they move up through school because they don't feel like they can engage is something which is quite hard hitting. So I think that um, we can definitely do something about empowering young women to actually deal with when they're faced with social media. I think, you know, improving kind of body positivity, having these accounts, but also making sure that young women and girls have the tools to kind of be confident in their own body and make sure that seeing these images doesn't affect their participation in sport and physical activity. Lisa Douglas. Um, from your research, I've seen that you've asked about fitness apps and how young women responded to them. 
what do you think needs to be done to allow these fitness apps to improve the experience young women are having with sports rather than hinder it? Samantha Stewart. Yeah. Um, again, we don't know too many details about specific apps that people were perhaps referring to, so that's something that might need to be looked into more. But again, the themes that emerged were that a lot of it was based on um, almost a competitive element and that many women felt that it was making them feel guilty for not reaching certain targets or not exercising enough, um, and also that they don't take into account women-only issues such as um, menstrual cycles or or um, pregnancy or, or that type of thing. So I think that there, that needs to be looked at in a bit more detail because, again, people were engaging. So I was, I was surprised by m most people saying that they use fitness apps. It's not something that I use or, or know much about, but that we are interested in it. Young women generally are interested in these apps and this content, but it's just not um, fit for purpose for, for what we want it. Um, foreign can then be counterproductive in a way because it just makes us feel guilty and that we aren't um, doing enough. So I think that, again, it would need to be looked at and having some software or approaches that are more um, applicable for young women's needs. Yes, Anna Henshaw. Um, yeah, just to uh, support uh, Sam's point, um, so some of the words that women use to describe these uh, fitness apps were mad pushy, messages, counting, uh, functional, and weight loss. Um, so I think that kind of gives us a good idea of what, what, where, where they're going wrong now and how they could potentially be improved. Lauren Aitchison. I can never tell if it's on, sorry. Um, just, you're just touching on guilt there, um, Samantha. So I just wanted to ask, um, there is such a, I was really su surprised um, by the number of young women who seem to follow these like fitness and exercise um, accounts and then how many still feel terrible about their engagement with exercise. And I see a lot of people my age now with their engagement with social media get like sort of curating their um, feeds and being like, no, I'm not going to feel bad about myself anymore. So do you think there is an element um, with younger women following these accounts purely because they feel like they should feel guilty about the way their bodies look and it's sort of a form of pun self-punishment? I suppose just what were your opinions? Ashley? Ashley Stein? I'll say something now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yes, I think <laughs> so. Um, I guess, uh, I suppose because like if you're from like a personal point of view, like f when I was gonna start doing exercise, I was like, cool, I'll go and look at all this stuff and find things to make me sort of like get an idea of what I should be doing. But then as soon as you do that, like all this other, like the algorithm takes over and then even if you don't, even if you unfollow all that stuff, um, all this other, it still comes up in your feed anyway, like on Twitter and Instagram and stuff. Um, and I think that even subconsciously, you you do sort of want to punish yourself for not being like that or for not getting to exercise uh, like until a certain point in your life or whatever. So you do maybe hang on to these really, really bad ideas for longer than you should have, um, even if you don't know you're doing it. Um, and yeah, I would definitely, I think everyone I've spoken to about this kind of thing, is, it feels like the same kind of vibe. So yeah, I think so. Yeah. Thank you. And the last two questions here be from Amy Leishman and then Beth Clotten. Amy Leishman. Um, so I think from all the um, evidence that we've heard so far, it's quite obvious that there's so many different views and opinions and so many different relationships that young women have with sport. Um, and especially in the social media context, some women feel more empowered, some women feel like they're not empowered. Do you think... Um, that we need a kind of targeted approach on social media rather than a one-size-fits-all, this is the solution, like regulation will help, or do you think we actually need to be looking um, at certain different groups and certain different methods? Can, can I add to that? Is it possible? <laughs> yes, Samantha Stewart. Um, yeah, I would, I would say that that is obviously in an ideal world, but that I don't think any of us think that, you know, that's... Um, going to happen or, or be possible anytime soon. 
Um, and social media isn't going to go away. So I think what was said earlier about teaching us about how to interact with these images and that um, what they actually mean and not taking it as that everyone's better than you and that they have a, a better life and things, because that has such a big impact on people's mental health. And that applies, I think, for all genders and all kind of <laughs> areas of life, but obviously particularly in this one that we're looking at. Um, so I think that there can be small changes if it was regulation to do with advertising and, and the promotion of products. Um, for example, that's the kind of big issue to start with. But just going through that, I think a general education and um, people taking responsibility for what they put on social media, but also when it's out there, how to deal with it. So I think it, it needs to be a mix of all those things and, and the attitudes just need to change a little bit. Okay, I noticed Nancy nodding away there. Would you like to make a comment, Nancy? Um, yeah, just in terms of like um, having, I think if we're going down a route of having governments or whoever controlling what goes on social media, it can get a bit not good in terms of free speech. You should be allowed to say what you want as long as you're not hurting anybody because a lot of people do put these things out you know, in good faith, they just are like, hey, I'm at the gym, I look great, I'm amazing, whatever. That's their social media and they can do what they like. So I think a lot does have to come down to teaching young girls especially not to take these things to heart. Like how to deal with these images without it affecting your own self-esteem, although it is very hard. <laughs> <laughs> Beth Clinton. I was just wondering, with any of the young women that responded, did they mention any apps or social media accounts that they found really helpful and positive? Yes, Katrina Lambert. Um, so, I don't think we had any specific um, kind of like answers about like specific apps um, that people had suggested. Um, I know anecdotally, I've had a few friends who have suggested them, but kind of what we were kind of being told overwhelmingly, even if young women were using um, these kind of like fitness apps, that they didn't feel like they catered specifically towards young women um, or women more generally. I think there's definitely a gap in the market for kind of um, these apps being catered towards women. So unfortunately, we didn't have any examples, although I, I'm sure that there definitely um, are examples out there. They're just not in the mainstream and not being used by enough women. Did any of you come across anything you thought, oh, that looks useful? That's sad. <laughs> Anna uh, well, I think uh, from our first uh, committee session, we heard evidence from the two body positivity bloggers, so um, I, I find those accounts personally very empowering and there is now more and more of them, so I think that's, I mean, of course, again, I don't have any numbers, this is just my personal Instagram feed that I'm curating, but I think if, if we ourselves make a change to engage with Instagram or social media on a more general basis in a more healthy way and maybe thinking twice about posting something and thinking about, okay, how will this affect all of the young women that are looking at my Instagram feed, then, yeah, if we start with ourselves and, and then maybe some something can change. That was a nice note to finish on. Thank you very much, panel. And we'll suspend until we have the fourth panel at the table. We we'll reconvene and welcome to our fourth and final panel this morning. This panel will be discussing the work they have done looking into good practice examples that do exist to increase young women's participation in sport and physical activity. And our panel is Diane Stewart, Janice Wong, Katie Heath and Amy King. May I invite you to do your introductory remarks. Um, so our group will probably follow on quite nicely from the last comments made. Um, and that we've been looking specifically at best practice examples in sport. Um, so we've been looking 
at the UK and beyond to try and get um, an understanding of the key themes that seem to emerge in uh, successful engagement. Our hope is that we can draw together some recommendations in order to encourage young women to feel like they have access to sport. So to do this, um, we contacted around 30 different organisations, asking the same five questions to try and get a consistent response. Um, we asked f uh, the questions to these 30 organisations and got eight in-depth interviews. We had two further responses from organisations who provided us with um, information on programmes that they ran to encourage engagement. We then pulled further information from secondary research, such as websites, newspaper articles, um, on five different organisations. So we've tried to make our engagement um, as varied as possible. An example of some of the um, organisations who have submitted evidence, we've had Project 42, an inclusive gym in Edinburgh, encouraging a positive mental attitude to health and fitness, Strathclyde Sirens netball team, street soccer, which encourages socially disadvantaged people into football, Feel Good Fitness, a women's only gym in Troon, um, a number of university sports organisations, Park Run, Run Mummy Run, The Daily Mile and Healthy Working Lives. Um, so from this research, we found that we were seeing three key recurring themes um, and we split this into barriers to engagement, successful engagement techniques and recommendations for further support. But I think we'll look at these later on. So we're going to focus mostly on barriers to engagement and successful engagement techniques. Um, so... Oh. Um, it's worth noting that our evidence is largely anecdotal, um, as it was conducted mostly through interviews. Um, comes from groups who've had a success with largely women 25 and above. Um, so we have to bear that in mind and hope that some of the evidence that we've been given can be applied to a younger age group. So while researching um, best practice, we found that it's been almost impossible to address how to engage women in sport without actually understanding the barriers that they face. So we found that Many of the organisations we contacted addressed these barriers and thought of a way to, con to, uh, to conquer them with their chosen demographic. In terms of barriers facing young women, we received a lot of feedback that it's difficult to engage school-aged young women in gyms and classes, and that gyms are having to make a special effort to reach out to this demographic. We found that successful engagement techniques focused on the space in which women exercise and making this somewhere they could incorporate into their lifestyle. A great example of this, cited by Feel Good Fitness, which is a women's only gym, noted that many women feel more comfortable working out in an all-female environment. It is not that they cannot work out with men, but members have suggested that in mixed gender classes and gyms they have previously attended, there was often a more competitive environment, and they found that to be off-putting and demotivating. By creating a welcoming, unintimidating environment, we are giving local women who are often lacking in confidence and often haven't taken part and exercising years, a safe space to ease back into a healthier lifestyle. So from this research, we found that it is clear that women don't tend to prioritise physical activity as a part of their lifestyle, and that one of the most the things we found most commonly was that um, organisations had to find a way to make activity a part of a lifestyle in general. Um, so we had both Run, Money, Run Mummy Run and Street Soccer speak about encouraging the community and social aspects with things such as running buddies and bringing a friend along to a class to try and encourage women to get engaged. Um, it's really important to have a friendly and open space, we found, and the most common word that we found in all of our evidence was um, environment and lifestyle. That continued to um, come up. So it's clear that um, it's especially hard to engage women after they've not been active in a while and that... Um, Often this attitude to exercise is found is created in school um, and that this bad attitude it sometimes carries on into later life. Um, this coupled with pressures of a changing body image, which always seems to happen around the same time, um, was noted a lot. So St Andrews University commented on this um, and they found that um, they've said that I think school sport still offers in places a poor sporting experience in an often male dominant environment. Separately, there is a great deal of body conscious propaganda at that age, which might cause people to withdraw from physical activity in general. So body image and social media, as we've previously heard, do have a huge impact on engagement. Um, and Jog Scotland also highlighted this to us, that even things such as getting changed and showered after an exercise class can be a really daunting experience, especially for young women. Um, so with the above to contend with, it's easy to understand why it's very difficult to engage young women. So we 
from the organisations we've contacted believe that there has to be a more holistic approach to physical education. Um, once we'd highlighted some of the barriers faced by young women, we found that um, most of the successful engagement techniques were specifically targeted at these barriers. Um, and our evidence suggests the best way to encourage um, young women into sport is by peer and community driven initiatives, which focus on positivity and fun. The majority of the engagement we've seen has been successfully introduced around um, women, having, women having children, um, as they're looking at a change in lifestyle anyway, that it tends to be a time when women can come back to sport. So we believe that the best way to encourage a younger generation is to focus on creating positive messages around body image and encouraging visible role models, as we've heard from the rest of the groups, from an amateur level all the way up to a professional level. Um, the best examples that we found of this were um, the Daily Mile and the Strathclyde Sirens, um, who actually specifically target young people. Um, so they look at not just the physical aspects of, for, of sport, but also um, exercise as a means of encouraging young people to work as a team based on the ability and skills of those around them. The Daily Mile stresses this across schools, encouraging daily activity in the form of a walk or jog, encouraging children to be outside and active in their surroundings. We also found that the Sirens had great um, engagement with Sirens for Success programme. This was rolled out across 42 schools, attracting 600 pupils to take part and looks to engage children specifically who previously were not interested in PE. They believe that by creating positive female role models while also teaching children about wellbeing, that um, levels of participation are increased. They found that 79% of PE teachers confirmed attendees recorded increased positivity and engage engagement towards physical activity, with 55% then going on to lead a more active lifestyle. Um, role models were mentioned in almost every response we had, um, which related to positive physical activity, whether it was peers in a running group or seeing more women in coaching roles. It's clear that this is really important. Um, it's important, therefore, to to stress that physical activity should not just be about appearance. Um, and Project 42 highlighted this very well, saying that when engaging anyone to take part in sport or physical activity, we believe it's important to promote the benefits to physical and mental health rather than focusing on body image. This is most important when engaging teens to take part in sport and physical activity as there is a greater proportion of under 16 year olds affected by body dysmorphia. It's clear that given the barriers faced, we need to re-educate young women on the link between physical appearance and sport and encourage exercise for fun and community feel. Um, just got one more quote from Feel Good Fitness who highlighted that this has definitely been their most successful way to engage. They've said, um, it's pretty evident that the ladies pursue active hobbies as a way of getting exercise without it feeling like a chore. For many, the enjoyment may be linked to social ties, weekend walking clubs to meet friends, or more solitary expeditions like a morning swim in the local pool, where they take time for themselves. So in many cases, I think just taking part in exercise with the primary aim to have fun seems to be the most engaging way to get women into sport and fitness. Init initiatives such as this are crucial to encouraging young women into sporting environments and tackling the barriers which we've identified. We should be encouraging as many positive examples as possible and create communities which not only understand women's bodies and requirements, but celebrate them. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I now invite questions. I'll start with Beth Clone. Thank you. Um, I was wondering what you think um, like support strategies could be put in place for women who can't access women-only environments? Amy King. Um, I think uh, a big part of this is revisiting policies for improving access um, from community level. Um, we have to really look at um, reaching diverse audiences through diverse representation. So that starts from engaging young women from diverse backgrounds in sport from a relatively early age and bedding them in to, and seeing the career progression aspects. Um, I think it's also important um, that uh, we look at more training for women to become coaches at, at vol volunteer and community level, um, as well as looking at the professional routes. Um, and I think um, for, for young women who are struggling to access, we need to make sure that um, we're listening to those issues. So, 
if, if young women are struggling, then they're going to say something about it. And we need to make sure that we are tapping into those communities and listening to where those barriers are and how we can you know, come, uh, overcome them. So it's very much a, a community-led approach, I think, that needs to be uh, taken. Janice Wong. The language is also really important in terms of how we engage with different groups. So from our evidence, um, there have been respondents that have said that even though PE was compulsory um, during the primary school or early education stages, they found that the language was quite technical, that they, they, they weren't keen on engaging in sport because all they wanted to do was have fun. So part of, it could be small changes, so from talking about sport to talking about physical activity, um, but also talking about community engagement, as what Amy was saying, and just getting involved and meeting people and also having fun, it's really important. Hmm. Amy Leishman. Um, research from the Young Women in Schools group also found that a lot of young, well not a lot of young women, but more young women than young men have to drop out of school and therefore physical education due to caring commitments. Um, you also said that a lot of mums um, find it difficult to re-engage with sports. How are um, like initiatives like Run Mummy Run and Jog Scotland um, actively reaching out to young carers or mums um, or are they, these women actually actively coming to the initiative themselves of their own accord? Katie Heath. Um, so a lot of the time it seems to be word of mouth with women and bringing friends along. So specifically with trying to engage um, mothers, we found that it was all about a change in lifestyle and creating an environment where you could bring your children along with you or there was a place for your children to be cared for. So. One of the gyms that we looked at in Edinburgh actually has a play area next to where the gym classes are so that you can see your children from where you are actually engaging in physical activity and know that they're being cared for. Um, and then Run, Money, Run Mummy Run encourage um, women to come with their prams um, and just walk around. And it's the social aspect rather than necessarily the physical activity. So it's being outside, it's taking on nature and bringing your child along with you, which we found is really important for encouraging young women because they, if they see activity at a young age, they're more likely to engage with it throughout their life. Kiara Maguire. Um, so you've obviously managed to find some really good examples of gyms and organisations that are doing a good job in managing to get young women to engage. So I was wondering um, how you think we can like share that learning and encourage other organisations to kind of adopt that best practice that we found. Diane Stewart. I actually think that from a lot of the engagement that a lot of these organisations want to share their information, they want to share the things that are working. And I think it's um, having now spoken to these organisations encouraged that conversation further. Becky White. Um, so how do you propose that you could take like these examples of good practices and implement them through policy? Do you think that would be possible? Or <coughs> What are your thoughts on that? Amy King. Um, I can't speak uh, to in depth on the policy side of things because my, my understanding is very top level, but I think that um, we need to look more to local authorities and encouraging them to implement changes that, that affect their own communities. Um, and wider you know, policy for the whole of Scotland as well, but it's very much from what we've learned. It is about a more individual experience or a community experience rather than all young women feel this. Um, so I think that there is a lot that could be done for um, encouraging com community-led experiences as well as helping those organisations and institutions that already exist to reach out to those uh, communities that do feel left behind. Katie, did you indicate? Yes, yeah. Katie Heath. Um, I think just to build on that, we saw that a lot of um, these initiatives rely on charity support or volunteers to give up time. Um, and we could do with some local authorities maybe providing monetary support um, to sort of build on these and be able to reach more women. Um, we think that a lot of issues surrounding um, like illness, low self-esteem and loneliness in Scotland, which are all pretty important topics right now, 
could be encouraged and that perhaps not as some of that um, funding could be helped um, through sport and physical activity. So um, we're just looking to see if maybe there could be an area there. Mm. Laura Nicholson. Um, with some of the other evidence that we've heard um, in relation to women that are still at school, um, body image came up a lot. And then obviously, because you're dealing with older women, that, that turned out to not really be as big an issue, um, which is great that women are hopefully getting a bit older and realising it's not the end of the world and that's not the point of their exercise. Um, and I was just wondering from um, speaking to these organisations wh whether um, there is a way to apply it to younger women to get them from like A to B quicker. <laughs> Janice Small. I think the way you can do that is actually having more role models um, across the board, and this is something that a lot of the other panels have touched upon today, and is actually having role models vertically, but also horizontally. So vertically in, in that, especially for a younger demographic, if they're engaging um, on social media quite frequently, then it's really important to see really powerful, independent female athletes um, doing their thing. And maybe it is for aesthetic reasons, but also to show their prowess. And, and I think we've, we've seen some of the pushback in some of the stronger, more prominent female athletes um, on social media. And also as you kind of transition off social media and into the older demographic of young women, um, we want to see communities and we want to see kind of more engagement and more support at the, at the local level. And so hopefully having role models across the board, both within your local area, within your community, within your peers, um, and having someone that you can actually relate to in real life and help that transition from offline to online. Do I have any other questions for this panel? Oh, she has one. <laughs> 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 um, I was just wondering why you don't think, um, like you were saying, like these bodies that you talk to like they have all this research that they really want people to listen to, but why do you think it's not been heard already or engaged with yet? Amy King. I think one of the main issues is that people haven't been talking about young women's relationship with sport until very recently. I think it's a topic that a lot of society has just put on a shelf and said, well, it's never going to change, or they haven't even realised that there is an issue to address. Um, because girls just don't like sport. These sorts of very damaging rhetoric that, that has um, permeated society from a very granular to an institutional level uh, has resulted in a lot of young women going unheard for years and years and years. And even those women who, are, who have grown up in that environment might not even realise that they have been wronged in this being the case. So with the likes of us shouting about young women's participation in sport and how important and how vital it is, we, we're allowing for a lot more internal reflection for organisations and individuals. Um, and now that that conversation has started, I think we are going to see a lot more people bring their own expertise and experience to the table and share willingly because people do want to make that change. They just didn't maybe realise until they heard the conversation start that they could even participate in it. Nancy Wallace. Um, is there anything you think that already existing organisations such as like gyms or even school PE could do to be more inclusive to women and girls? Diane Stewart. Um, I think one of the things that came up um, a lot, uh, along a lot of the different organisations we spoke to, but specifically in the women in sport, why are women reluctant to run report um, by Parkrun? They talk about how to get women engaged, they find that if the organisation's um, sort of values align more with women's values, so Parkrun specifically focus on community, volunteering and um, sort of family-led, it's across generation, um, that's a way of, of engaging. And actually it's the values behind the organisation and behind the, the activity that can have a positive impact. I think Katie wanted to say something too, and then uh, I'll go to Amy and Janice if she wishes. Um, I was just going to uh, talk a little bit about the relationship from school onwards and that um, 
the community driven aspect also brought up a lot of things around um, gender specific classes and feeling a bit more comfortable in a women led community um, and that perhaps the women later on in life were attracted to a more female community and that that might be something that we could encourage maybe more in sport at school um, to try and make young girls more comfortable to participate when they can see other people around them. Amy King. Um, I think another part of this um, that's really important is the emphasis for um, single gender um, inclusion classes. So um, from school through gyms, um, when we have a girls only class, there does seem to be a better engagement with the activity. Um, and in promoting that option, we open a lot more doors to people because they might start off feeling more comfortable in a, you know, a, a women only class or gym. And then when they grow their confidence, they might decide to, you know, branch out and try different activities and different um, organisations as well. Um, and with school, when you allow young women to learn in an environment that is specifically catered for them and their needs, they do perform much better. That it does not just apply to physical, uh, physical education, but particularly in physical education, as um, Professor David Kirk um, presented uh, evidence at our previous committee. So I think there is a, a real need to identify where um, the, the, the women only or the girls only um, classes and spaces can be of great benefit. Janice Wong. Also having more female experts and women who are actually coaches or volunteers, um, as a lot of the panelists have said previously, really help um, in terms of actually having girls and young women recognize that it's possible um, to be an expert, to be good um, in, in, in sports, particularly sports that may be not traditionally female dominated, um, as well as also including the spaces where all girls are free and happy to participate. It's really important that they see that there are people who are teaching them who understand perhaps some of their struggles because they, they probably would have faced them earlier in life. Oh, Amy King has to have the last one. <laughs> I do. It's, it's, in, it's in my bones. Um, I think the final thing that I'd like to add to all of that is um, the point on uh, competitiveness in sport and the relationship that a lot of young women have or the negative relationship a lot of young women have with competitive sport um, and offering a wider range of non-competitive and competitive sports for young women will almost certainly see an increase in engagement because... Um, a lot of young women do just want to do this for fun. They do just want to move their body. They don't want to race against their peers. Um, and it removes a lot more of the anxiety around being good at or better at or bad at a particular activity, which uh, does seem to permeate a lot of the discussion that uh, young women have around sport rather than physical activity. Thank you very much, panel. That was extremely interesting. Right, we have a few minutes left, and I would like to, uh, before I ask Beth Clotten as Vice Convener to do a little summary for us of what, well, don't panic, <laughs> <laughs> a very general summary of what we've heard and the way forward. I, I thought we could just go around those who are our committee members today and ask for a quick comment on what you've heard, and we'll start with Kiara Maguire. No pressure. Um, no, I just think it was really interesting and there was so much overlap, um, which I think we kind of knew when we started our research that there's a lot of overlap in our different research, but it's been good to hear like, specific examples of what can be done better and what we can do well. Rona Wilder. Um, yeah, I think the thing about um, women's only classes is really interesting and it would be useful to find out what we could teach in the, the boys only classes that would encourage them to maybe be less competitive or <laughs> <laughs> some education there that means that there's there's less um, that that when when the classes are mixed that the women feel like they can participate. Maxine Kearney. Yeah, I think it was really interesting and I think we can take back a lot and do quite a lot. So I'm really looking forward to what we can do for this. Becky White. 
Um, I found it really interesting how all the responses about um, following like, the body positive um, accounts on Instagram, they weren't all, like, because they were following them, it didn't make them feel entirely positive, which on the surface you think it would. So I think that's really interesting. Amy Leishman. Um, I think the fact that we all spent quite a lot of time focusing on social media and the body confidence issues, we obviously had a lot of questions for each group, but for that specific group, there was a lot of questions. Really highlights that just within our group, that is a really ma that's a massive issue, um, social media and body confidence, and it's something that affects us all. So I think that's definitely something that we need to take on and look forward to. Lauren Aitchison. Um, I think I just want to say I know like a lot of the stuff that we deal with is because of the nature of the topic is anecdotal and I think it's just um, great to hear that so many stories and that hopefully people will feel less alone that they're going through this experience and that they're not just crap at sport um, and that um, hopefully they're going to benefit from what we're finding out. Nancy Wallace. At the beginning of this process I thought I wouldn't really be interested in the topic because I'm not that sporty myself but having done all this research and spoken about it with each other I've learned there's a reason why I'm not that interested in sports so you know so it's been quite interesting to see how sexism has, sexism has like permeated this subject and I'm excited to see what we can do. Um, I think it's been really interesting to see the difference between the barriers facing young women in sports, like the assumptions made about them and the actual evidence that's been gathered and whether they actually coincide. Olivia, can you get... I, I think it was really interesting about the findings and why like, it was difficult for women to get engaged with sports with the barriers they faced. But also, as well, I was really um, interested in hearing about the elitism aspect of sports and where the pressure starts with young women not able to um, come back with the stresses and the, and the female coaches as well, helping them get engaged and feeling more of support system to get them through to each levels of competitiveness. That was really interesting to hear. And more about um, the intersectionality aspect of the reasoning, what are the barriers for joining, for not participating in sport and what we can do as a community and as like nationally, what we could do to start implementing um, resources and organisation to help break down those barriers for women taking part in sports. Yeah. And Beth Clutton. Well, help, hopefully you all gave a great overview, so I'll just make a few comments. <laughs> um, I feel like there's just such a clear message that um, young women are massively disadvantaged and feeling like they can access and enjoy a sporting life. Um, and I'm really excited to hear what recommendations you all come up with to confront and combat what these barriers are. So well done. It's really great. Okay, can I say um, I, I thoroughly enjoyed the session. We heard from four excellent panels. Some really good work's been done and some very interesting and thought-provoking uh, work has been carried out and presented very, very well. So I'm certain that the committee has loads to discuss before our next and final meeting, which will take place on Friday, 31st of May. That's when we'll take our final evidence on the issue and then the really hard work begins. It's about agreeing a report on the findings and how, very important, how we can best use that report to really try and make a difference because it's quite clear from the work you've all done that it is time that that difference should be recognised and everyone involved should work forward for it. So thank you very much, all of you who took part. And it was really good to see that we had some visitors in today uh, listening to the great work that has been carried out. So thank you, everyone. And this meeting is closed. And I don't have a gavel. <laughs>